Hello, my name is Taya Graham, and welcome to the Police Accountability Report. As I always make clear, this show has a single purpose, holding the politically powerful institution of policing accountable. And to do so, we don't just focus on the bad behavior of individual cops. Instead, we examine the system that makes bad policing possible. And today, we will do so by showing this video of an arrest of an Indiana man in Terry Haute for not walking on the sidewalk on a road that, wait for it, doesn't actually have a sidewalk. But we will also be examining body camera footage we obtained from the department and the questions it raised about what really motivated the officer to make such a needless arrest. But before I get started, I want you watching to know that if you have evidence of police misconduct, please email it to us privately at par at therealnews.com and please like, share, and comment on our videos. You know I read your comments and appreciate them. And of course, you can always reach out to me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Facebook and Twitter. And of course, if you can, please hit the Patreon donate link pinned in the comments below because we do have some extras there for our PAR family. All right, we've gotten all that out of the way. Now, one of the worst aspects of our American criminal justice system is how it seems to offer very little hope for redemption. That is, paying your debt to society rarely turns into freedom from law enforcement's badge-touting bill collectors, so to speak. The imperatives to keep bodies in jail and book arrest stats means that somebody has to end up in cuffs, which makes the previously incarcerated an easy and inviting target. And no arrest embodies the notion that there are no second acts in American law enforcement than the terrifying encounter Joseph Davis had with a Terry Haute, Indiana Police Department officer last year. Davis was walking after dropping his car off at a mechanic when an officer stopped his patrol car to interrogate him. As the encounter began, Davis turned on his cell phone and started recording. And as you can see from what he captured, the cop literally begins giving him a hard time for not walking on a sidewalk that does not exist. Let's watch. Because I recorded him. Okay, you're gonna tell me your name? How, how does this work out? I just told this officer my name Joseph your, Davis. Put your hands on your back. My name is put Joseph your Davis. Hands your and he's taking my phone, put my hands on my back because I got him on, on camera. Since I recorded him. Because I recorded him. Now, as you can see, the officer initiates an arrest and Davis ends up in handcuffs in the back of a patrol car. And as I explained already, the entire incident was over the purported crime of not walking on a sidewalk. And let me emphasize, a sidewalk that doesn't exist. And just to note, the code which the cop used to arrest Mr. Davis is Indiana Law 9-21-17-12. And as you can see here, the law is pretty clear. If a sidewalk is provided and the sidewalk's use is practicable, a pedestrian may not walk along and upon an adjacent roadway. Hmm. Seems like more than a stretch to me. It seems like an illegal arrest. Now, usually when a cop arrests someone for, frankly, what we have labeled in a previous show, and forgive my language, but a bullshit crime, they create some sort of pretext to hide the absurdity of the charges, meaning they rarely admit the true nature of what they've done, and instead, they make something up, which is why ultimately the officer added the charge that Davis failed to identify himself. But when we reviewed the body camera footage we obtained, the officer lets his guard down and actually tells the truth. You put me in jail for walking in the street, man. Yes. I'm a grown ass man, I can't walk. Oh my God. Violate my probation and everything, right? On walking in the street. That's, that's, Send me back to prison for walking in the fucking street, man. That is my fault. Hey, so my request to talk to a sergeant is being denied. I'll call one. They're all on calls right now. You seen my red shoes I got on, right? I did not. Okay. Dude, if you would have just told me, bro, listen, I tried were... to, I tried to tell you, bro. You didn't tell you, me. You, 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 listen. I got PTSD for messing with police officers, bro. I just told you I've been to the penitentiary three times, bro, over serious stuff. This, this walking in the street, bro. Yeah. I got red boots on. It's raining outside. Mm -hmm. It's dark as hell on that street, bro. It's dogs and all type of stuff on that street. Look at my boots, bro. I got red bulls to boots on, bro. I don't want to mess my boots up, stepping yeah. in dog stuff. If, if you would have told me your birthday, come on, man. That's all you'd have to do. You bro, that's, that's even, petty, like a, bro. That's petty. I don't know who you are. You didn't even you didn't even call over the thing to ask. You didn't I, even ask if, to call over the thing and ask who I was, bro. I asked you. You have to have a birthday to work somebody else. Huh? You have to have a birthday to work somebody else. 
Yes. Thanks to a Public Information Act request we filed with the Terry Hill Police Department, we were able to obtain the body camera footage that revealed a rare moment of candor for this cop. Let's watch. You couldn't find nothing else serious. This, this is a serious violation for you, huh? No. I wasn't trying to arrest you. You put people in jail for walking in the street. No, it's for failure to identify. It's a separate IC code. You did see how dark that street was, right? Because you flashed the light in my face, right? Okay, okay, that's all I wanted to hear about. And also, just to verify the street did not have a sidewalk, Mr. Davis returned to the same location and made this video, which makes the conversation between Davis and the officer caught on body camera even more bizarre. My name is Joseph Davis, and I'm going to show you the video. Okay, this is the walking on 8th Avenue. Now, I was walking this way, and I turned left, which is North 24th. As you can see, there is no sidewalks on either side of the street. And do you see how the sidewalk or how the, the curb goes out to where the cars park right here? This is the area where I was walking at. So it's raining, it's dark. I don't want to walk in the grass. So I walk in the street, plus the trees are hanging down. I'll be walking too close to the house. So I'm walking this way and I'm gonna try to walk fast so the video don't be too long. But as you can see, no sidewalk. But there is much more to this story than just a simple bad arrest. And for more on that, we'll be talking to Mr. Davis later in the show. But first, I'm joined by my reporting partner, Stephen Janis, who's also been looking into the case. Stephen, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So first, why didn't the officer activate his body camera during the arrest, as is required in Indiana? What did the city say? Well, you know, I went through a lot of effort to get this body camera footage. And what's really interesting was that the body camera footage starts only once the officer has Mr. Davis in the car. And I said, what's going on here? And the excuse they gave me was that the body camera f are, are automatically activated when a person goes on a call, but there was another call the officer was on. And I find this very, very, very suspicious because I don't know exactly why his body camera would have been activated throughout the entire encounter. So it's something that, you know, I don't find it being a satisfying answer at all. Now, prosecutors are still pressing ahead with the case. Who is justifying moving forward with this case and what did they tell you? The prosecutor's office uh, has not been forthcoming, but what's really interesting about it is what Mr. Davis said during our interview, which is that there's $140 that they want him to pay. I think they just want to collect the fine is what I, all I can tell because it's not even on a docket I can find. The case is kind of a mysterious case that doesn't seem to have any sort of legal backing. So I'm going to keep calling the prosecutor's office and try to find out. But at this point, it seems like they just want to get their money and Mr. Davis will be on his way, hopefully. So, Stephen, I know we've talked about so-called bullshit crimes on a podcast, but can you explain the concept and how it relates to this arrest? The idea was we we're talking about one of our favorite uh, anthropologists, David Graeber, who wrote a book about five bullshit jobs. And the idea was that jobs are just made up to keep rich people richer that don't really accomplish anything or have no really productive outcome. And you think about it in the spectrum of policing, taking the time to arrest Mr. Davis, who's trying to get his life together, is, is completely destructive. And it's something that doesn't need to be done. And, and then we see this over and over again, where these arrests happen that don't need to happen. Meanwhile, you know, homicide cases in places like Baltimore are closed 20, 30 percent of the time. Only 20 percent of burglaries are solved. So it's this constant excessive, you know, sort of dependence upon arrests that have no productive outcome that we're talking about when we say bullshit crimes. And they need to be called what they are. They're bullshit. And now for more on the encounter and his arrest and what this says about the system itself, I'm joined by Mr. Joseph Davis. Mr. Davis, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So first, set the scene for us. What were you doing when the officer stopped his car and started talking to you? Well, I was just walking up the street. I mean, it, there was no sidewalks. It was all grass and it was raining. It was eight o'clock at nighttime, you know, and Terre Haute, it, it, they just don't have adequate light, nor sidewalks, you know? And I mean, I wasn't impeding traffic. You know, I was walking towards traffic you know, and I was off to the side. The officer was on the complete other side of the road and he passed, he went to get to the stop sign and passed the stop sign and then reversed back to confront me. He put the, he put the light in my face and he jumped out the car as well. Like it was a, it was a quick transaction. Like, okay, then let it be that. There's no reason for you to jump out the car 
and, and, and be aggressive. You know what I mean? And then not only that, it's just me and him out there. There was nobody else out there until I, I felt like my life was about to be in danger, really, to tell you the truth. I felt like my life was about to be in danger. So I got a little bit louder to let people know that I was outside. You know what I'm saying? And I only got loud when I was saying my name. That's the only time I got loud. You know, and I, as soon as I got the phone out, that's when he arrested me. So what did he accuse you of initially and how did he justify the stop? You're supposed to be walking on the sidewalk. The sidewalks are available. I turned around and pointed behind me and in front of me and, and physically pointed towards there was no sidewalks. And I, I even explained to him the outfit that I had. I had on a red, well, a burgundy jogging outfit. And I had on some, uh, some red Bulls limited edition Timberland boots. You know, and I was in my vehicle before this had even happened. I dropped my vehicle off to get fixed and I walked to a friend's house. So I was walking back to my vehicle and it, it was raining outside. So I don't want to walk in the mud. I don't, it's loose dogs out there and stuff like that. I don't want to step in anything. And I'm informing him that this is what I got on. This is the reason why I'm walking in the street. So what happened when he put you in handcuffs? What did he say? Uh, he, he was asking me to identify myself when he was putting me in the handcuffs. But it was like, it happened so fast. Like I said, I, was, I felt like my life was in danger. So when I took my phone out, immediately he jumped towards me. You know what I mean? And you can see, like, if you see my video, you'll see soon as I take my phone out, it's like a couple seconds and I'm screaming my name and he's grabbing me at the same time, you know, putting me in handcuffs. And I'm pleading with him. I'm, I'm, I'm asking him, like, bro, I didn't been to prison. Please don't violate my probation. You know, I got five years probation. This is, this is, this is petty. You know what I mean? But he's saying he's, he knows he doesn't care. This is what he's saying. I don't care. Doesn't matter. You're going to jail. You know, I still really don't understand what the crime is here. What are the charges against you? And how long were you in jail? It's, it's still confusing to me because I still haven't had a chance to really sit down and talk to my lawyer about what the charge is. I, I believe that they charge me with failure to identify, not the walking on the sidewalk. It's a citation. That was a that's a ticket, you know. So I guess they charge me with the failure to identify. We looked at the actual language from the law and it says that there must be a sidewalk available to make walking on the street a crime. What do you think was actually behind this arrest? I really I really don't want to, you know, say anything that might get me in trouble, you know what I mean, as far as, because I live here. I live here in Terre Haute. You know, my children are here in Terre Haute, and I don't want them to retaliate against me. I really feel like they are at this point. When he pulled me over on that dark street by myself, and it was just me and him, and the way he flashed that light in my face, and the way he jumped out aggressively, I felt like he he really wanted to try to get him one under his belt or something. Like, try to jump on me, beat me up or something like that. I don't know what it was, but he may have thought that I was a drug dealer or something, that he was going to get him an easy arrest or, or find something on me or a gun or something like that. Now, I feel like once once he, once he I raised my voice and got people to come outside, because people started coming outside and they were, they were asking what was going on, I feel like he kind of panicked. You know, he kind of panicked because now you you you, you don't, what, what are you going to do? What was your initial plan is, is to that now. So you've watched the body camera footage that we've obtained. What are your thoughts on what the cop told you in the car? Yeah, I guess he told him that, you know, somebody had called in and made a complaint on him because they felt like he was harassing me because I was walking up the street, seen me walking up the street and they had heard me saying my name. And he told them, well, I, I don't know what the conversation really was, but I take from the conversation. The dude, the guy that was on the phone was talking out of it. And he was like, well, state law says that you have to walk on sidewalk. So I'm taking him to jail. So city officials say his camera was not activated during the arrest itself. Do you believe them or do you think they're hiding something? I think, I, I think they're hiding something because when you watch the video, he puts his hand up there, but the camera's already on. So it's not like he pushed the button to turn it on. You know, it's already on when he first gets in the car. So 
I, I don't know if they had something to use at trial or, or something like that. I don't know. But all I do know is that I want this to be over. I don't want to go through this. I don't want to sit in your courtroom for four hours for you to tell me that, you know, uh, yeah, we're going to postpone it for three months off, you know, because the prosecutor's not ready. Okay, so now you got to come back three months off. Okay, now I'm sitting in your courtroom for four more hours for no reason. For you, you know what I'm saying? This could be settled, you know? It could be settled. Real easy. I'm not paying $140, though. That's not going to happen. I, I I apologize for you guys having to pay for the video. And a guy out here who follows the police, he paid for the video, too. So they got $300 off a of video, and they want $150 from me. Where the money going to? Because it's not going towards putting no sidewalks. It's not going towards the re-education of how people deal with police officers when we get pulled over. We don't know to ask them, am I being detained? Because if that if it's that simple, that's easy. Am I being detained? Yes or no? If it's no, I'm gone. How am I going? How am I going? They're going to put this case off for a long time. And, and you know the crazy thing about it is, I have no problem with fighting this case to the death of me. Because you can't fight these cases in jail. You can't fight, you can't defend yourself in jail. They give you limited access to the law. Out here, I can talk to all types of people and get all types of help and get all types of opinions and, 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 and stuff like that. I'm not stopping. They 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 shouldn't have did that to me. They shouldn't have did it to me. And and not only that, I asked him, I begged him not to do it. How has this affected your life? I know you said you're trying to get your life back on track after some run-ins with the law. How has the arrest affected your goals? It kind of changed my goals. Like while I was in prison, I got me a peace of mind. God set me down for a reason to give me a little bit more patience because I was moving too fast. So I sat down and I said, okay, well, I'm going to do the family thing. I'm going to raise my kids and, you know what I'm saying, just live life. But after this situation, I was so angry. It was so much, it's so much more that goes on to this. Like, I, I don't know if y'all can get the, the the video footage from the county jail, but that that scene right there, that just adds to it. It's, it's, it's a conglomerate of things. That, that, that that's the reason why it's bothering me because I'm just going to give you an overview of what happened in the county jail. So when I get in the county jail, they don't put me in handcuffs, you know, because the police officers, they, they trying to be cool. They, they laughing at dude, like, you know what I'm saying? Why would you lock him up? So they bring another black guy in and he's being belligerent. He's loud, you know, that, that that's typically how we are with police officers. You know what I'm saying? It, it, we, we feel like they are against us and they feel like we against them. So, they bring him in. They got him in handcuffs. They got him up against the wall. And he's talking crazy to this young officer. The uh, arresting officer leaves out. The young officer gets upset because he's turning his head while he's talking to him. He got, he got him up against the wall, but he's turning his head while he's talking to him. So they jump on him. They they slam him on the ground, like really get bust him open. Now, mind you, I'm sitting there with no handcuffs on. And this is three or four, it's, it's three European youngsters jumping on this, this black man. And I'm sitting there like, okay, well, in my mind, I got two choices. I can either go home or I can help this man because they wrong. I'm steady dealing with this inhumane stuff that they got going on. No, Nobody's policing Terre Haute police, but pol the, the Terre Haute police. That's it. I, I bet you didn't hear any, well, you from a different place, but... I bet nobody heard anything about the state police and the, the, the city police getting into a fisticuff fight and nobody went to jail. Nobody went to jail. How? Y'all are human beings. Y'all bleed just like us. Y'all take shits just like us. Y'all eat just like us. Y'all get up and go to work. Y'all raise kids just like everything. Y'all should suffer the same laws as we suffer. There should be no difference. Now, I think what we have is an example of what is often referred to on the show as the concept of blanket criminality. That is, a community police view as inherently criminal in total, and thus subject to indiscriminate arrests and random enforcement of the law. This is a particularly pernicious concept used by law enforcement to wield power in big cities like ours and in smaller communities as well. And it is mostly an idea aimed at the working class of those communities to diminish their political efficacy 
and their ability to fight back. Consider recent reporting by the Washington Post on the penchant for police officers to rack up millions in court settlements and how little was done to address it. According to their series, 25 major cities have paid out $3 billion, that's billion with a B, for misconduct settlements. And many of those cases involve officers who have multiple claims against them. Bear in mind, these are cities and communities struggling economically, like my own hometown of Baltimore or Detroit, Michigan, hardly cities that could afford a constantly rising tab for police misconduct, given how much they already spend on law enforcement. But despite the existence of repeat offenders and some officers who have literally cost the city hundreds of thousands of dollars each, none of the cities were tracking the worst offenses. That's right, in a city like ours, where water bills have been raised roughly 10% per year for as long as I can remember, nobody was keeping tabs on wayward cops who seemed to have a habit of getting sued. I mean, I want you to think about the implications here. Individual cops running up major tabs on the taxpayer dime that cost cities billions, and nobody, not a single person, is keeping an eye on it. No one is alarmed by either the allegations that these same cops violate people's rights or the rising price tags for cities that could least afford it. No one even bothers to take an officer aside and say, hey, stop making illegal arrests or stop beating people up. It's costing us a fortune. Instead, as the Post notes, the settlements were seen just as the cost of doing business. The question is, what kind of business is that? I guess based on our reporting, it's the business of illegally charging American citizens with bogus crimes, violating their constitutional rights, and inflicting unwarranted bodily harm. So basically destroying people's lives. Interesting business. I wonder what their side hustle is. Which is why the arrest of Joseph Davis is so important, because someone needs to talk to these cops and explain to them how consequential an arrest actually is, how incarcerating a human being is pretty much torture, and that taking someone's freedom when you're annoyed and because your authority has been challenged is both morally and legally reprehensible. I mean, even though I've literally produced over 100 episodes of this show, I'm still astounded at how casually police turn to an arrest as a solution for a temporary problem, how often they take out the cuffs without considering the implications of imprisonment for the person they're putting in the cage. Honestly, I just can't reconcile the idea that we live in a free and open society with the unchecked power we bestow on police, which I witness on this show every week. But it's also the reason I report on cases like Joseph's, because I think the two ideals are mutually exclusive. That is, every bit of power we concede to the police subtracts from the freedoms that should be reserved for us. Every bad arrest we allow to go without accountability chips away at the rights and expectations of freedom that belong to the people. Each time we call bad policing good business, we degenerate the sense of equity and justice that underlies our basic notion of what a productive community really is. And that's why we won't stop calling attention to police overreach. And that's why we will continue to hold bad actors accountable and keep you informed when no one else will. I wanna thank Joseph for taking the time to speak with us and for sharing his experience. Thank you, Joseph. And of course, I want to thank intrepid reporter Stephen Janis for his writing, research, and editing on this piece. Thank you, Stephen. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And I want to thank friend of the show, Noli D, for her support. Thanks, Noli D. And thanks, Lacey R. And a very special thanks to our Patreons. We appreciate you so much. And I want you watching to know that if you have evidence of police misconduct or brutality, please share it with us and we might be able to investigate for you please reach out to us. You can email us tips privately at par at therealnews.com and share your evidence of police misconduct. You can also message us at Police Accountability Report on Facebook or Instagram or at Eyes on Police on Twitter. And of course, you can always message me directly at Taya's Baltimore on Twitter and Facebook. And please like and comment. I really do read your comments and appreciate them. And we do have a Patreon link pinned in the comments below. So if you feel inspired to donate, please do. We don't run ads or take corporate dollars. So anything you can spare is greatly appreciated. My name is Taya Graham, and I'm your host of the Police Accountability Report. Please be safe out there.